while I'm the nostalgia critic. I remember it so you don't have to. <laughs> right now, I'm in the laboratory of Dr. Hack, the master of formulas. Not scientific formulas, not mathematical formulas, but television formulas. <laughs> Any TV show that has a formula that's been repeated over and over and over, he's the guy that came up with it. Watch this. Might be more from Power Rangers! Land Teen Spike Play Patrol, then Monster, then Giant Monster and Giant Robot. Home Improvement! Toolman screws up, Nipper gives advice, Toolman gets advice wrong, but Toolman's forgiven anyway. Scooby-Doo! It's always the person in the opening you forgot about. Inspector Gadget, Captain Planet, Everybody Loves Raymond. Everybody actually hates Raymond. He should have divorced that bitch and her family long ago. If it's a formula that's gotten more and more popular through its repetition, he's the guy that thought of it. And right now, I've hired him to think up an idea so that I can lazily repeat it over and over and over and make money beyond my wildest dreams. Eureka! Eureka! What? Oh, there you are, Eureka. Get ready to jot down my latest formula. You got it? Yes, and it's going to make us millions. Well, that's wonderful! Let's hear it! 14-year-old girl acts stupid, uses magical powers to look slutty and stupid, talking cat tells her how to fight crime because she's so stupid, surrounds herself with smarter girls that make her look even more stupid. That's Sailor Moon. What? The formula you're describing is Sailor Moon. Do they have a villain that keeps attacking the same town? Yes. Do they have a tedious romance with a magic boyfriend? Yes. Do they repeat the same animation? Worse than Hanna Barbera! And it was successful? It's one of the most popular animes of all time! Hmm. Eureka? Oh dear, well this is embarrassing. Um, well how about this one? Three obnoxiously perfect girls are raised by three obnoxiously perfect men in a house in San Francisco, and not one of them is gay. Well, while we're on the subject, why was something as repetitive as Sailor Moon so successful? Fighting evil by the moonlight, winning love by daylight. I remember when it first aired in America. It was an export from Japan, which I think was originally called Magical Girl Squad Robo Dance, yes. Not quite as familiar with anime as Americans are today, a lot of people just saw it as Speed Racer with tits. But we didn't understand that the audience for this was growing more and more rapid. And whether for its campiness or actual enjoyment of the story, it was becoming an underground hit for kids, teens, and that creepy guy who fixes your computer. So, what is the secret formula and why did it catch on with so many? Well, let's start at the very beginning. You'll quickly notice that, like many animes, the best parts of the show aren't in the action, the character, the story, or the writing. It's in the goddamn opening theme song. Not only is the beat catchy as hell, but look at this animation! Look at the visuals! It's like a Van Gogh of anime kid openings. In fact, there's even a Van Gogh in it! Don't ask why, I don't care, it looks friggin' awesome! I'll allow it! I guess the only downside is the obvious American edition, like this pointless Star Wars style scroll. Yeah, because that's what girls watching this show are really into. Star Wars! They go so hand in hand, I'm surprised Lucas didn't release a more feminine version with Serena doing Darth Vader. Did you hear there's a new Sailor V video game out? I saw it on TV! Lord Vader, the battle station plans are not aboard this ship. Oh yeah. And no transmissions were made. How can that be? My mom finds out she'll ground me and cut my allowance. The escape pod was jettisoned during the fight. No life forms were aboard. I can't believe this! Oh! <laughs> we can get ice cream! Yes, sir. See if you can spot where else the Americans made some changes. They're so subtle, I doubt you'll ever notice where they geniusly slipped them in. Yeah, unbelievably natural. If you were going less for action packed adventure and more for Saved by the Bell credits. When I wake up in the morning and the lawn gets out of water, I don't think I'll ever make it on time. But you quickly discover in many respects, that is what the show is going for. At first it seems like it's going to be a big, albeit, audience-insultingly rushed space battle between cosmic planet... people... folk. A thousand years ago, our moon was home to a great civilization ruled by Queen Serenity. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. 
until the arrival of the evil Queen Beryl. Although her world was destroyed, Queen Serenity's last hope was the power of the Empyrean Silver Crystal and the Crescent Moon Wand. Only this crystalline wand can combat the power of the Negaforce. Yeah, look, show. even if you pretend you have a story that matters beyond people who see a high-class meal as a flame in Hot Pocket, you still had to follow up all that supposed epicness with this. Ah! Oh no, I'm late for school again! Yeah, I bet you thought this was going to be a big space opera with action, drama, and exotic locations. But nope, it's just your common English-speaking town that has everything in Japanese for some reason. Serena! I gotta go! Aren't you forgetting something, dear? Oh yeah, your nose! Everyone's forgetting those around here. This is Serena, a titsy clod who has no idea that she is one of the reincarnations of the Sailor Scouts. She's just your everyday gigantic eyed blonde Japanese girl who constantly keeps flunking her exams. What? Chill out, Serena. It's just one lousy test. It's not like it's the end of the world or something. You don't understand. I'm Japanese. To me, failure is everything. You don't get it, Molly. If my mom finds out I flunked that test, I won't get to play the new Sailor V game. Being pretty as sin and dumb as cheese, she of course is very popular in school, obtaining all sorts of friends. Like an over-the-top accent with a human attached to it. <gasps> That's weird! Very weird! And the awkward years of Dr. Insano's puberty. You're going shopping? What's more important than your grades? Science, of course! When not hanging out with these frightening adolescent creations, she spends most of her time solving her problems by intelligently ignoring them and finding more ways to spend her mother's money. I heard about your test. Want me to be your tutor? She doesn't need uh, a tutor. She needs a trip to the mall to get her mind off this. I could use some new pink brevets for my hair. Education just gives you wrinkles. She also seems to get in fights with an attractive boy named Darian. What was that you were saying about someone totally cool? Oh. But we can be sure it isn't you. Shouldn't you be going home and doing your homework, Meatball Head? Hey, that's clearly an insult to meatballs. <laughs> well, how's this for inspiration? You're a creep, Darian! You don't know a thing about me! Wow, they really seem like polar opposites and hate each other to the core. They hook up? Mm. Nah. And how tediously long do they drag that out? <laughs> oh, Jesus, just mail me the comedic banter to my office shredder! By the way, here's a confusing scene. We see her walk by a poster of a young girl dressed exactly how she is dressed. Like it's from a movie or a show or something. I wish I could be like Sailor V. She's so beautiful and smart. Something exciting's always happening in her life, not like mine. So, what? A movie or TV industry got wind of this idea that coincidentally is exactly the same as what's going on right now? Does that mean that something like Transformers is a true story, then? Because, to be fair, my car has been giving me dirty looks. <coughs> Things seem to change, that is, the formula is set in motion, when a magic cat named Luna arrives and tells her that she is the reincarnation of one of the Guardians. You are Sailor Moon, and you must fight evil when it confronts you. Just repeat after me. Moon Prism Power. Moon Prism! And of course, this gives way to the famous transformation scene. The tiara, the boots, the nail polish, later covered by gloves, so that was pointless. And of course, the miniskirt. The mini, 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 mini skirt. Yep, the costume choice that in no way enables her to fight better, but sure does force her to squat a lot. Okay, so take out the fact that's obviously in no way battle armor. Take out the fact that's obviously fan service. Take out the fact that just like He-Man, somehow removing more clothes bizarrely disguises them. Though to be fair with both these outfits, is the face really the first thing you're gonna be looking at? Take all that away and just tell yourself, this obviously sexualized transformation that takes up a solid minute in each episode happens to a 14-year-old girl. Yeah, forgot that for a second, didn't ya? The girls in this show are, and always have been, 14 years old. 14 years old. 14 years old. 14... Damn! Uh, years old. Now, before any of you find this incredibly creepy, let me make one thing perfectly clear. The age of consent in many parts of Japan is, in fact, 
13 years old. Now you may find it incredibly creepy. And yes, there's a lot of fine print to that law that evens it out a bit, but there's just as much fine print that evens it back into kinky territory again. For example, sex between 13 to 17 year olds can only be done with other 13 to 17 year olds. That's good! However, that's only sex. Groping, hand jobs, blow jobs, and whatever else your preferred imagination can come up with is all perfectly legal. That's bad. However, they have cracked down on human trafficking, forced prostitution, and other illegal acts endangering people in that age range. That's good! But that doesn't stop people from creating kinky establishments like the Sexual Harassment Corporation where you pay to molest girls in school and business sets and is totally, 100% legal. Can I go now? So, um, yeah, I guess when you come down to it, it is just cultural differences. I mean, sexual urges in young people does start well before 18. My personal problem is, like media in most cultures, it doesn't try to help younger people understand sexuality, but rather exploits it. Rather than educate young people about sex, it's honestly just easier if we can make money off of it. But, of course, all this talk about Sailor Moon being a sexy 14-year-old pinup is all building up to one important question. Given this information, why did I still put her in the top 11 hottest anime of women list? I didn't know! I swear I didn't know! I mean, look at the way they're drawn, man! I thought they were in college or at the very least late high school! Wouldn't you have made that guess? Come on, look at the way they're showing them off! I swear, officer! I mean, audience! I had no idea their real age. I mean, you might be saying to yourself, Oh, what, didn't you grow up watching the show? Didn't you pay attention to it at all? No, no, I didn't! I mean, I, I watched it, but I didn't really listen to it. I too was 14 at a time, and maybe I viewed it for different reasons. Stupid homework. Oh my god, this is awful. Turn that back on. Who said that? I did. Penis? Yeah. You can talk? All penises talk around this age. It's the greatest secret no woman knows about, but wouldn't be the least bit shocked to discover. Well, despite what a terrifying discovery this is, I'm still not gonna watch this show. It doesn't matter what you think. From now on, I'll be calling all the shots. You're gonna see everything in a whole new light. What are you talking about? Look at that show again. Looks damn good now, doesn't it? Wow, there's more to this show than I thought. Oh yeah. No! I'm a mentally capable male! I won't let my penis call all my decisions for me! Turn that back on, or I'll shoot where the sun always shines. No, I won't. Excuse me, I have some memories I need to repress. I think I've properly erased those memories. They'll be back. Quiet or I'll write another groin shot joke. So Serena... <clears throat> so Serena seems shocked that she can now suddenly transform. This dream is getting weirder and weirder. I'll never study that hard again. Though weirdly enough, doesn't look the least bit shocked while she's transforming. In fact, I bet she'll keep this exact same calm state every single time she changes. And every villain she's fighting will quietly wait for her to finish before actually attacking. It's the Japanese way. Speaking of which, there actually is a villain in this series, known as Queen Beryl. Yes, because no name is more terrifying than a wooden container that can bring me alcohol. Actually, you sure she's not the hero? She uses her evil minion named Jedite. Eh, too obvious. To get energy out of the people of Earth, all to serve the evil realm of the Negaverse. Or as Luna likes to put it, the Negaverse. The Negaverse. The Negaverse. The Negaverse. The Negaverse. The Negaverse. How does Jedi plan to do this? By creating various monsters targeting people's lust for jewelry, pop singers, fitness, and pretty much anything exploiting the empty shallowness of all mankind. So naturally, Serena is never far behind, often falling for the majority of his evil plans. 
Please get in this evil device, which is in no way an evil device. Joke's on you, it was an evil device. But once Luna reminds Serena to use her brain, she goes through her petalicious transformation and is ready to kick ass. Luna, I wanna go home! Or cowers in the corner like a fucking scaredy cat. I don't wanna do this anymore! I can't, I'm too scared! Get me out of here now! In fact, the fucking scaredy cat is braver than her! You must fight this evil monster or the whole universe could cease to exist. It's time to become Sailor Moon. Let's go! You have to stand and fight. Be brave. That's exactly what she's doing! She's running from a real fight! Come on, you idiot. Don't pussy out. Pussy up! I think it can also be used that way. Yeah! Well, it'll probably surprise no one that Sailor Moon actually does very little physical fighting in this show. Which is no big shock if she even raises her knee a centimeter to kick, she exposes her goodies to the world. Which in many parts of Japan, of course, is no big problem anyway. Most of the fight scenes require her being trapped or stuck in something for probably longer than is needed. But hey, anything to save on that action-packed detailed animation that we're... Just going to repeat anyway! In fact, the one you'll see most often next to the transformation sequence is her using a magic tiara which turns her enemies to dust. Or, in this case, the guy doing the magic act next door comes to save her, then allowing her to throw her goddamn tiara. You must believe in yourself, Sailor Moon! Tuxedo Mask, thank you! Don't mention it. This is Tuxedo Mask, and yes, it is painfully obvious who it really is, but please don't tell Serena, she's not very bright! Others will test you. Do not be afraid. What a hunky guy. He's so dreamy. And not at all like that other guy who I hate so much. Thank God they have nothing in common and are two completely different people. Oh, hi, Clark. Get any new pictures of Superman lately? The magic tiara isn't her only enchanted device, though. She also has a pen that can change her into anything. Wait, what? It's a very powerful transforming tool. It turns you into whatever you want. Well, then what the fuck is she using that tiara for? I mean, they didn't give any limitations or anything. They said she can change into fucking anything she wants. Why doesn't she just turn around and be like, take on the form of Godzilla? <laughs> Series over, six seasons spared. But nope, she uses it just to don disguises, which really aren't necessary, seeing how all you have to do is throw on a bathing suit and a napkin over your crotch, and apparently nobody will recognize you. And besides, we know she's gonna leave the real fighting to the other Sailor Scouts. Oh yeah, I should probably talk about them. The other reincarnations of the Scouts are found over time, usually in the exact same city and often even the exact same school. So, maybe Jedi should try his evil plans in another part of town. I mean, it's not like the Power Rangers that can beam anywhere. All this show does is glorify how lazy Serena is. Serena, a monster is attacking Tokyo! How far away is that? About 10 miles. Hey, it's just Tokyo. But you should... These other sailors are Sailor Mars, who uses fire, Sailor Jupiter, who uses thunder, Sailor Venus, who uses energy beams, and Sailor Mercury, who uses... FUCKING BUBBLES! Their personalities are about as on par as, oh, let's say, the Spice Girls. No, no, that's too demeaning. Um, let's say handsome. But to their credit, they are the ones who do most of the work. And they're eventually joined by another cat named Artemis. Stop squabbling. And yes, even the other planets over time join the group as well. Ooh, except Pluto. Um, you're not a planet anymore, so, um, yeah. And to answer your question, yes, every kid snickered like an idiot when they heard there really was a Sailor Uranus. But, um... <laughs> Actually, things got kind of interesting with her character, seeing how Uranus and Neptune were cousins in the show, but not in the Japanese version. No, no, in the Japanese version, they were a couple. <laughs> That's right, straight up lesbians. What was that? Nothing, I said nothing! Yeah, kind of funny how we can sex up our 14 year olds all we want, but the idea of them being attracted to something that don't have a penis apparently was too much for Americans back then. So just to check. Okay, shame. Okay, shame. Come on, guys, maybe you could have worked it into your half ass PSAs at the end. 
Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, there's PSAs in this show. Obviously slapped on at the end of each episode using the same animation they used before. Because Laura knows, the show hasn't repeated enough animation already. Starving yourself and exercising till you drop is not a smart way to lose weight. Like a car without gas, our bodies can't run without food. Good nutritional food. To say they're time fillers is an understatement. Half the time, they don't even bother to fill in the dead air they care so little about it. Daydreams are nice, especially the ones about... food. <laughs> oh, daydreams are cool, all right. But just don't forget about the here and now. Yeah, if they want a more appropriate ending, they go with something like this. Hey kids, a lot of time we get angry letters from your parents because we know our show makes you dumber. So here's our last minute table scraps to try and teach you something in the last few seconds we have. Um, brush your teeth. <laughs> or in the case of the lesbian duo, maybe they can do something like... Hey kids, you got boys and you got girls. Pick one! <laughs> and guys, that's as far as I got. I know there's more characters and more villains, but I specifically wanted to address the repeated formula that got Sailor Moon popular in the US, and why on earth it actually worked. And that formula, as I can figure out, is as such. Serena acts like a selfish idiot, supportive friends pick up her slack, Pharaoh rubs Crystal Ball like a boob and sends Jedi out to create monster and or device to obtain energy using a marketing tool targeted towards vain suburbanites. One of the scouts discovers the plan or fall for it herself. Transformation takes place via reused sexually confusing animation. Scout or scouts are trapped. Pratt in the hat seems to get them out and do nothing else. Serena never figures out who he is. Uses her magic tiara that she should have used earlier instead of reusing more dialogue footage. Destroys villain and goes back to being an idiot again. So yeah, just to double check again, why did this work? Perhaps like a lot of other formulas, it knew what to keep familiar and what to keep changing up. It knew it was going to have a villain, but it changed up what kind of villain. It knew it had to involve an interest or product that girls wanted to be involved with, so it had a different one each episode. There was always peril that the girls had to get out of so that you'd feel great by the end when they finally do. Keeping the formula exactly the same, but changing up just the right elements that needed to be changed. So, do I enjoy the show? Fuck no. Does it have an ingenious formula? Fuck yes. Is it bad for kids? Fuck, not really. While the Serena character is an annoying airhead, I will give her credit that she does at the very least have a character. It's not one that I like, but at the same time, it would have been easy just to make her a pretty face with no personality. But she clearly does have a personality and goes to big extremes. And they do make her look strange and bizarre just as much as they do make her look pretty half the time. And though, yeah, she can be self-centered, she's never really mean, per se. And I guess from what I understand, the character does get smarter as the series goes on. Or at the very least, braver. As for sexing up a 14-year-old? I think it's weird, but I guess there's always just gonna be cultural differences. And in all honesty, we've let out much worse. Unlike a lot of pop stars and teen magazines where the artificiality is all that's there, this at least allows girls the fantasy of being the hero and actually doing something. Even if it is mixed in with that artificiality as well. But I don't know if Serena's dummy reaction to it all always shows it in such a good light. But the moments where she fights back and saves the day is always shown in a good light. So have fun with your little show, just keep it as far away as you can from me. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, I remember. Hello? Mr. Critic? Uh, Dr. Hawk thinks he may have, like, finished that formula or whatever. Lead on. Alright, Critic, I know I messed up with the Sailor Moon formula, but I've come up with a formula that's even better. Even better? You mean, like, more successful than Sailor Moon? Three times more successful. Really? Yes, according to my calculations, this should be the most famous, most profitable formula the world has ever known! Good God, Dr. Hack! What is it? What is it? Okay, okay. Three online performers, two male, one female, remake movies with the help of a German cameraman and Irish immigrant. Oh, 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 oh. 
Well, I'd say it's been a while since we talked about this topic, hasn't it? It still feels like yesterday that Alison Pregler and the rest of the former Channel Awesome staff helped to expose Mike Mashad, Brad Jones, and the Walker brothers for the scum that they are. I guess Larry Bundy Jr. really is the last man standing. I know it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it really has been over a year since the whole Change the Channel movement. But I think the fact that it's still being talked about really resonates the impact that it made. To make a long story short, back in April 2018, a 72-page document was released exposing a lot, and I do mean a lot, of disgusting information about the company. At first it wasn't too big, but eventually it started to get a huge following, with a lot of people closely associated with the company explaining the problems going on behind the scenes. From scamming people out of their money, to not providing food and water for people working on their projects, to failing to provide a safe work environment for the other producers, to wrongfully firing someone after they got out of surgery, there's actually quite a to cover that would require its own video. And as a response to this little matter, Channel Awesome in their infinite wisdom decided to put out a half-ass non-apology, a half-ass response accusing people behind the document as blatant liars, and through their own incompetence indirectly revealed that Juario was a sex offender and a rapist. Ooh. They made no attempt to apologize to the people they fucked over, including Juario's victims, stayed silent, sweeped it under the rug, moved on like nothing ever happened, and proceeded to mass block people on Twitter in a desperate attempt at damage control. To say that people were upset about this would be putting it very lightly. And I'll admit, I was one of those people who was very vocal about it at the time. Initially, I was only planning to do a response to the Jungle Book 2016 episode, where he utterly fails to comprehend the movie in even the most basic ways. One major gripe that I had with the episode in particular is how he fancied the idea that it was trying to be a dark and gritty adult version of the animated movie, in spite of the very obvious fact that it was meant to be seen and understood by children. Of course, when the Change the Channel movement came out and they utterly refused to address the problems, I felt compelled to talk about them again. Breaking down the Deadpool 2 episode detailing the absolute clusterfuck that was their way of distracting people from the document. A lot of people have been saying that we should just get over it because it's old news or it's not relevant anymore. How it was just another hate trend that would outlast its welcome after a few weeks. Even though it's still being talked about and people are still mocking them for it on Twitter. Which is pretty much the equivalent of saying we should just forget all about the sex crimes Bill Cosby committed and allow him to start a new season of his show on Netflix. You see, it doesn't actually matter how long ago the movement was. The reason why it was done in the first place is still the fact of the matter. The company is still being run by morally reprehensible people who don't deserve their audience. They showed no remorse, regret, or contrition for the crimes they committed, and just did a bunch of finger-pointing and victim-blaming while being coddled by whatever idiots are still supporting them after that utter disaster. So as long as they continue to be absolute scumbags about years of abuse and lies while putting out shitty content, they're entitled to whatever criticism they receive. Which brings us to the subject of today's video. Considered to be an oldie but a goodie, the Sailor Moon episode of The Nostalgia Critic, originally uploaded in 2013, is a very, very special kind of bad. Trust me, folks, we're in for a fun one today. The dozens of ways in which this episode fails is simply magical. It is literally so bad that it is, with no exaggeration, even worse than the other two. And I know what you might be thinking. This was an episode made in 2013, when the show appeared to have a better sense of control over itself. It's not a clipless review, so there's less cringe-inducing sketches along the way. And it was also done during a time when the sketches weren't so excessive. And even beyond that, getting information wrong on something and not bringing any nuance to a review is fairly common in Nostalgia Critic these days. And this was made long before the Change the Channel movement, so we didn't make this episode as a distraction from any elephants in the room. What could possibly make it worse than The Jungle Book and Deadpool 2? Well, let's start by bringing up a little Easter egg. At some point in time, Doug got the brilliant idea to nickname Sailor Moon Jailbait the Show. At a convention. In front of hundreds of people. What does this have to do with anything, you might ask? Well, I want you to keep that piece of information in mind because this really plays a role in understanding why the episode is... just so disgusting. And here we go. The episode starts with a sketch where Doug and a mad scientist are trying to concoct a formula for a show that'll give them riches. He does this while listing a bunch of stereotypical summaries of other shows, one of them happening to be Power Rangers. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers! Land teens fight play patrol, then monster, then giant monster and giant robot. And considering that Sailor Moon was actually based on that same formula, you'd think that what ends up happening next would be less asinine. Get ready to jot down my latest formula. You got it? Yes, and it's going to make us millions. Well, that's wonderful! Let's hear it! 
14 year old girl acts stupid, uses magical powers to look slutty and stupid, talking cat tells her how to fight crime because she's so stupid, surrounds herself with smarter girls that make her look even more stupid. So according to Doug, Sailor Moon is just a bunch of 14 year old girls using magic powers while looking slutty. Which is absolutely nothing like what the show actually is. And aside from this just being a horrible summary of the show, this opening sketch acts as a frame for the comedy of the rest of the episode. Sailor Moon is stupid and slutty. Did you think that was funny? Because we got 20 more minutes minutes of this shit. So after taking a jab at Full House, Doug proceeds to do a brief overview of the show's popularity and then dives into the review. And only 40 seconds in, we already come across a huge red flag. I guess the only downside is the obvious American editions, like this pointless Star Wars style scroll. Yeah, because that's what girls watching this show are really into. Star Wars! They go so hand in hand, I'm surprised Lucas didn't release a more feminine version with Serena doing Darth Vader. Oh. Fuck you, dog. Fuck you. This is the kind of shit I expect to see from Kathleen Kennedy. He is seriously jumping to the conclusion that Star Wars is not something that can be enjoyed by girls. Why? Because there's only one primary female character in the original trilogy? I don't care how you slice it, that's straight up sexist. How the hell did he even come to this conclusion? Star Wars was made for a general audience. There were women and girls who watched it before The Force Awakens. And he's saying this after he just acknowledged that Sailor Moon has fans of both genders. One of the cosplayers he shows in the opening screen cap is literally a boy. And before you reach for the it's just a joke or the it's comedy excuse, that doesn't make it okay. It was terribly translated in a very careless manner. And this joke is a reflection of what Doug actually thinks of the show. How do I know this? Because it's literally a running theme behind the scenes. If you were to look at the commentary on behind the scenes of several episodes, like the real thoughts and first viewing videos, a lot of the jokes that Doug puts into the final cut of a Nostalgia Critic episode are entirely based on his initial viewings of the thing in question. Sherman from Peabody and Sherman had a sex change. <laughs> <laughs> so young. Did Good. you have a feeling? Did you have a feeling? I had a feeling. I don't know. Some Vera comes home to her daughter, who is presumably Sherman, after he got a sex change. Which, let's be honest, we all saw that coming. Again, it's like the movement of this guy could be funny. It's like they're onto something, but they're not talented. His career is on the rise. Let's see if we can put a stop to that by casting him as someone who's supposed to move funny, but instead moves like a sped up inflatable outside of a car rental. He thought of the joke, wrote it into the script, acted it out, edited it, and allowed it to appear in the final version. So what am I supposed to take from this other than he deliberately said something stupid and insensitive just because he thought it would be funny? And what else do you think he could be saying here? If girls can't like Star Wars, does this also mean that girls can't like Transformers? Can girls not like G.I. Joe? Can girls not like Johnny Quest? Can girls girls not like Ninja Turtles? Can girls not like Batman? Can girls not like Ninja Turtles teaming up with Batman? Can girls not like Mortal Kombat? And this is something that can also be taken both ways. Can boys not like My Little Pony? Jem? The Wings Club? Totally Spies? As told by Ginger? If that's the case, I would be in therapy right now. I know it seems like I'm making a big deal out of the first joke of this review, but it's a gateway to a huge problem with this episode. It is absurdly misogynistic. You thought I was just making a backhanded comment in my Deadpool 2 response? No, it's a reoccurring problem throughout the video. Don't believe me? Well, we're just getting started. He proceeds to briefly go over the prologue, followed by an Avatar reference that's neither funny or needed, and he reacts to the setup of the main plot. Although her world was destroyed, Queen Serenity's last hope was the power of the Empyrean Silver Crystal and the Crescent Moon Wand. Only this crystal and wand can combat the power of the Negaforce. Yeah, look, show. even if you pretend you have a story that matters beyond people who see a high-class meal as a flame in Hot Pocket, you still had to follow up all that supposed epicness with this. Ah! Oh no, I'm late for school again! Yeah, I bet you thought this was going to be a big space opera with action, drama, and exotic locations. But nope, it's just your common English-speaking town that has everything in Japanese for some reason. This is actually why the story has an importance to it. It may come across as off-tonish, but it's necessary for establishing the setting. The idea of Sailor Moon was taking the Greek legend of Selene and Endymion and having it take place in a modern setting. I can sort of understand Doug not knowing this since I don't expect him to be an expert in Greek mythology, but it still serves as one of the many examples for how not good his research was on this show. Yeah, it's another reoccurring problem that becomes very apparent as we move forward. She's just your everyday gigantic eye blonde Japanese girl who constantly keeps flunking her exams. Oh, chill out, Serena. It's just one lousy test. 
It's not like it's the end of the world or something. You don't understand. I'm Japanese. To me, failure is everything. Oh, gee, a Japanese kid who thinks grades are everything because she's Japanese. That's a lazy stereotype and you know it. Being pretty as sin and dumb as cheese, she of course is very popular in school, obtaining all sorts of friends. Actually, Serena was anything but popular. Outside of a few friends, she has a hard time getting along with other students as well as the teachers. Oh, but according to Doug, she must be popular because she's pretty as sin and dumb as cheese. Remember, kids, Sailor Moon is slutty and stupid. Like an over-the-top accent with a human attached to it. Actually, if you look into it, Molly's heavily Brooklyn accent is a reference to her Japanese actress also having a heavy accent. And the next couple of minutes is just snarky comments that aren't clever or funny, so they're not really worth mentioning. Now, this just might be a me problem, but this is another issue with the episode. The pacing is too slow. Currently, we're seven minutes into the episode, but it feels like it's been 12 because of all the unwitty comments and cutaway jokes. And so far, he hasn't given any interesting information about Sailor Moon. All we've gotten so far is a boring sketch, a very sexist remark, and a couple of quibbles where he didn't pay attention to the episode or do any research on the show. I get that he's going scene by scene of the pilot, but there's a lot of better ways you can do it. By the way, here's a confusing scene. We see her walk by a poster of a young girl dressed exactly how she is dressed. Like it's from a movie or a show or something. I wish I could be like Sailor V. She's so beautiful and smart. Something exciting's always happening in her life, not like mine. So, what? A movie or TV industry got wind of this idea that coincidentally is exactly the same as what's going on right now? Does that mean that something like Transformers is a true story then? Alright, I know I've been putting this on pause a lot, but here's another problem. Doug is going on this confusing exposition on what Sailor V is supposed to be. We even see Serena bring her up a few times. But it's clearly Sailor Venus, one of the Sailor Scouts. Why is this an issue? Because later in the episode, Doug talks about how the disguises don't work on the Sailor Scouts. So he's complaining about the disguises being obvious, but he's unable to recognize Sailor V himself. It's really not that hard to figure out. It's actually pretty common knowledge if you've seen the opening to the point that you don't even have to read the prequel manga. All you have to do is remove the mask and boom, it's Mina wearing one of the Sailor Scout uniforms. How does Doug not see this? The picture is literally right in front of him. He just finished talking about the opening sequence and he doesn't even see a resemblance between Venus and Mina? This is a mistake that a child could have avoided making. How exactly did Doug even miss this? He clearly had to have been involved in the episode's editing. He was practically given dozens of chances to recognize how Sailor V is Mina and he just blew every single one of them. Look, Doug, I know that expecting you to be competent at this kind of thing is wishful thinking at this point, but maybe if you paid more attention to the episode that you said that you watched, which I'm really starting to doubt at this point, you would have been able to answer your own question. Maybe you're just too blind as a bat to even notice. So after that, we get to the scene where Serena learns how to use her powers after talking with Luna. No, 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 not that one. Doug begins to comment on it, and try to bear with me, folks, because this is where things get really fucking creepy. And of course, the miniskirt. The mini, 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 mini skirt. Yep, the costume choice that in no way enables her to fight better, but sure does force her to squat a lot. Okay, so take out the fact that's obviously in no way battle armor. Take out the fact that's obviously fan service. Take out the fact that just like He-Man, somehow removing more clothes bizarrely disguises them. Though to be fair with both these outfits, is the face really the first thing you're going to be looking at? Take all that away and just tell yourself, this obviously sexualized transformation that takes up a solid minute in each episode happens to a 14-year-old girl. Yeah, forgot that for a second, didn't you? The girls in this show are, and always have been, 14 years old. 14 years old. 14 years old. 40 damn uh, years old okay that right there that was messed up oh my fucking lord 
There is literally so much wrong with this couple of seconds that I could write a book about it. First of all, the transformation scenes are not fan service, Like, at all. There's no jiggling boobs or perverted gleams in these transformations. The focus is put on the outfits and accessories the Sailor Scouts wear for battle. Their movements don't even imply any sort of fan service. They're graceful poses and well-choreographed movements that emphasize how they're getting ready to kick some butt. The sound design fits the visual aesthetic, the music has a good beat to it, and the art style is smooth and really elegant. That's not sexualized, that's fucking badass. Doug seems to think that these transformation scenes are just perverted strip teasing, because yeah, putting on clothes is definitely what counts as strip teasing. The Twilight movies had more strip teasing. Second, what the hell is wrong with you? You clearly stated that these characters are 14 years old, and you're still funning over how attractive they look in these transformations. How has this been up for almost six years, and no one has ever bothered to bring it up? Were you people really that distracted by his utterly unfunny jokes and utterly unintelligent reviews for so long that a brony in 2019 had to be the one to bring this up? And don't even think about giving me that it was a joke bull crap, because this directly ties into his top 11 sexiest animated women video. He literally brings it up in the episode itself. And then it's followed by him trying to explain how he not only didn't know how Serena was 14 years old, but because he didn't know how old she was, that makes it okay. But, of course, all this talk about Sailor Moon being a sexy 14-year-old pinup is all building up to one important question. Given this information, why did I still put her in the top 11 hottest anime of women list? I didn't know! I swear I didn't know! I mean, look at the way they're drawn, man! I thought they were in college or at the very least late high school! Wouldn't you have made that guess? Come on, look at the way they're showing them off! You really are that stupid, aren't you? You can't just say that you didn't know how old she was and use that as an excuse. That's not how it works, you fucking idiot. And for that matter, you seriously couldn't tell that Serena was a teenager? For the love of God, I was a dumb little kid when this show came out, and even I could tell she was a teenager. How you came to the conclusion that she was a woman is a mystery to me. Are you seriously telling us that you can recognize a girl's sexual history or age just by looking at them? You can't. You can't! That's like telling people you can recognize someone's ethnicity or race just by looking at them. It doesn't work! Wouldn't you have made that guess? Come on, look at the way they're showing them off! I swear, officer! I mean audience! Did... Did he really just say that? No, 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 no. He couldn't have. He really couldn't have. He did not just say that! I swear, officer! I mean audience! 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 I had no idea the real age! What the fuck is wrong with you, dude? Okay. That's it. This is where I draw the line. Remember that stuff I said at the beginning? How he called Sailor Moon jailbait the show at a convention? How a lot of the jokes he makes in his reviews are based on how he sees the movie or the show in real life? Because that's literally how Doug Walker sees Sailor Moon. He sees it as jailbait. Did he seriously not take a moment to think about how people would see that? Did he really not see this as a problem? Did he simply not understand how this would look really, really bad on his end? He just made a bunch of snarky remarks about how he thought Sailor Moon was sexually attractive without knowing how old she was, then proceeds to make jokes about finding them attractive in this episode anyway, even calling the show jailbait after he did this review, and just didn't care at all about how gross it actually was. 14 year old girl acts stupid, uses magical powers to look slutty and stupid. 40 damn! Uh, years old. I swear officer, I mean audience, I had no idea the real age. <gasps> Walker, you are such a fucking creep! Go! No! Keep it together, man! Okay, 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 okay. For the sake of my sanity, let's forget about the whole 14 years old thing and rewind a couple of moments back. So, what else is there to talk about? Now, before any of you find this incredibly creepy, let me make one thing perfectly clear. 
the age of consent in many parts of Japan is in fact 13 years old. Now you may find it incredibly creepy. Oh no. Yeah, if you thought this episode wasn't problematic before, then you're in for a serious wake-up call. This is where Doug proceeds to talk about consent laws in Japan and sexuality in general, and it comes across as really out of left field. Aside from just being not needed at all, it takes up a good chunk of the review just to show how little Doug knows about what he's actually talking about. And while I am aware that Japan does have problems with this kind of stuff, what makes you think Doug has any better knowledge about it? And aside from that, why would anyone even want to see that? Seriously, going to an episode of Nostalgia Critic to learn about sex is like going to Quentin Reviews for political commentary. It's unwarranted, uncomfortable, and it just comes right the hell out of nowhere. But let's try breaking it down into more detail. Firstly, he says that the transformations look slutty just because they have miniskirts and they show off their legs. Because according to Doug, no woman or girl in the history of the human race has ever worn a miniskirt or something that makes their legs visible. What about these pictures of ballerina dancers and figure skaters? What about these pictures of Katana and Melina from Mortal Kombat? Are they supposed to be dressing as slutty just because they have miniskirts or wearing something that shows their legs? Just because something comes across as revealing doesn't automatically make it slutty. It's called context, which is something that he didn't take into account with these transformation scenes. He also mentions how the sexualization of girls in media doesn't teach people about sex and is only doing it to exploit it for profit. But there's a problem with that. Doug just said that looking like this, or this, regardless of the context behind it, automatically makes you look slutty, which is just painfully sexist in every way that you look at it. He's making an extremely broad assumption based solely on looks without any actual first-hand knowledge on the subject. It's like he's blaming the girls for looking slutty instead of himself for taking it as slutty without set context. It's not my fault I think Sailor Moon looks slutty. She's wearing a miniskirt and revealing her legs. I mean, what else am I supposed to take away from the scene where he's being turned on by the transformations and the ramble about how he didn't know she was 14? He's just reinforcing the belief that it's Sailor Moon's fault that he didn't bother to look up basic information on the character. Then it gets worse when he not only blames Sailor Moon, but also starts talking about how we should be blaming Japan for his fuck-up. You see, Japan is the creepy one because their age of consent is 13. They're the ones to blame for Doug calling a 14-year-old slutty and thinking the transformation scenes are fanservice strip-teasing. Which is strange, because throughout this whole ramble, Doug doesn't seem to take America's consent laws into account. While it's true that the US consent law is higher at 16 years old, they still have the same close-in-age exception as Japan. And while Japan does have a club where you can pay to grope women dressed in school outfits and business sets, you can literally do the same thing in America and just hope the woman doesn't come after you. It's called roleplay. Also, there's this bit. Sex between 13 to 17 year olds can only be done with other 13 to 17 year olds. That's good. However, that's only sex. Groping, handjobs, blowjobs, and whatever else your preferred imagination can come up with is all perfectly legal. That's bad. Did Doug Walker, a man in his 30s, really just say that handjobs and blowjobs are outside of sex? I really don't need to explain what's wrong with that, do I? Ah, fuck it, I'm gonna do it anyway. Blowjobs are a form of oral sex. Just because it's not vaginal doesn't mean it's not explicit. And the same thing goes for hand jobs. It doesn't matter where it is, the penis is still being stroked by something. How do you not get this? Did you just not take a sex ed class? You don't even need a sex ed class to know that blowjobs and hand jobs are explicit forms of sex. This man is literally so goddamn stupid that he thinks oral sex doesn't count as sex. This asswipe has a million subscribers and I don't. So following the ramble on Japan sex laws and the dreaded I didn't know she was 14, good god, why is any member of my species still supporting this idiot after that? We get a sketch about Doug remembering his younger self and his experiences with Sailor Moon. And I want to let you guys know right now that this is by far one of the worst sketches in the entire series. It's right up there with the Adam Sandler phone call and the Real Chipmunks movie musical number. As well as the horribly drawn out Where is the Proof parody from Final Fantasy The Spirit Within where he also happens to make a joke about Notre Dame burning down only a few weeks after the tragedy. Seriously, does this shit stain even follow his own advice? And it's also another example of his sexist behavior in this episode. And on behalf of the moon, I will punish you! Oh my god, this is awful! Turn that back on. Who said that? I did. Penis? Yeah. You can talk. All penises talk around this age. It's the greatest secret no woman knows about, but wouldn't be the least bit shocked to discover. Uh... 
All right, to quote Doug himself. Who the fuck am I looking at? Well, despite what a terrifying discovery this is, I'm still not gonna watch this show. It doesn't matter what you think. From now on, I'll be calling all the shots. You're gonna see everything in a whole new light. Okay, I am currently questioning every decision I've ever made in my life leading to this moment. Can someone just kill me, please? I know I still have a lot to live for, but I don't want to live with the knowledge that I had to sit through Doug waving his junk at a camera three inches away from my face. What are you talking about? Look at that show again. Looks damn good now, doesn't it? Wow. There's more to this show than I thought. Oh yeah. No, I'm a mentally capable male. I won't let my penis call all my decisions for me. Turn that back on. Or I'll shoot where the sun always shines. Okay, when did this turn into South Park? So what I'm getting from this is that Duck is being held hostage by his dick to watch Sailor Moon for its non-existent sex appeal. Because it's still not his fault that he saw Sailor Moon as slutty. I shouldn't have to tell anyone this, but your penis does not make you do stuff. Sexual urges do not have the ability to hold you hostage to them. This might just be seen as Duck making a really shitty joke, but a fairly big part of society has somehow trained itself to believe that. You know all those commercials, movies, and TV shows that seem to have this aggressive portrayal of the stereotype that men only think about sex and want sex from a woman? I wonder how much money he makes. I wonder if he loves his mother. I wonder if he'll lose his hair. I wonder if he wants kids. I wonder if he's the one. I wanna sleep with her, 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 I wanna sleep with her. I want her Pepsi Max, I want her Pepsi Max, I want her Pepsi Max. Not a chance. Damn! Wait, for which one? Because that's exactly what Doug is doing here. Men are perverts and only think about getting laid. Men think about sex a lot and it's the primary thing on their mind. Men are perverts who can control their sexual side. It is such a stupid stereotype that has long since overstayed its welcome. It probably started as a joke on some sitcom somewhere, but it has long since stopped being funny. And the fact that Doug is applying that stereotype to Sailor Moon makes it even worse. He's making the assumption that any guy who ever watched this show only ever watched it for its supposed fan service. Something that Doug clearly doesn't seem to understand is that the show wasn't made for teenagers. It was made to be family friendly. And he doesn't consider that people didn't watch it for a sex appeal, but then I'm just thinking out loud here, watched it for its characters and the story. And the sketch also plays into another stereotypical problem. Given the way he portrays himself and the way that he only thinks Sailor Moon is sexy when she's transforming, he's feeding into the belief that while men are sex crazed no matter how they're dressed, sexuality in women only exists when they're quote-unquote wearing something sexy. Remember the earlier image where he showed real 14-year-old girls alongside the Sailor Moon transformation? He was clearly doing it to show how real 14-year-old girls aren't sexualized in the way he thinks Sailor Moon was. But but Sailor Moon was never being sexualized at any point. So not only does this comparison have no purpose, but it further feeds the sexist idea that because Sailor Moon's outfit looks the way that it does, it must be slutty or fan service. I really don't know why Doug thought this whole five minute segment was a good idea, but it really seems to capture the mindset that he made when making this episode. Slut shaming, sexism, encouraging the idea that men are perverts who can control their sexual urges, so not only is he being sexist towards women, but men as well. Oh my god, he's Kathleen Kennedy 2.0. Mild racism towards Japan, and of course, getting information wrong for the sake of a joke because he thinks comedy is more important. Alright, I've spent more than enough time on this five minute segment and I just want to move forward. So Serena seems shocked that she can now suddenly transform. This dream is getting weirder and weirder, I'll never study that hard again! Though weirdly enough doesn't look the least bit shocked while she's transforming. In fact, I bet she'll keep this exact same calm state every single time she changes. Well, of course she's not gonna be surprised the second time she transforms. She already knows what's coming, so it's not gonna catch her off guard. Speaking of which, there actually is a villain in this series, known as Queen Beryl. Yes, because no name is more terrifying than a wooden container that can bring me alcohol. Actually, you sure she's not the hero? Beryl is named after a mineral of the same name. It's a type of gemstone that has several varieties, like emerald and aquamarine. And it fits because some of the lore of Sailor Moon involves certain types of gemstones. In fact, a lot of the villains are named after gemstones and metals because the author of the series, Naoko Takeuchi, majored in chemistry in college. How did you mistake that for a container of alcohol? They're not even spelt the same.
Oh, and did I mention that Kayoko Takayuchi is a woman? You know, the sex that you practically spent the last five minutes mocking, and not a man who was trying to exploit sex for profit? How's those sexism jokes going for you now? You really didn't bother to do any research on this series, did you? She uses her evil minion named Jedite. Eh, too obvious. Yep, I'm convinced. You didn't bother to do any research on Sailor Moon because if you did, you know that Jedi is named after a gemstone like Beryl is. They weren't just taking stuff from Star Wars to write on its popularity. And after that horrible girls can't like Star Wars comment you made earlier, I'm pretty sure you have no place to talk about Star Wars. You incompetent moron! Look, I'm not expecting Duck to be an expert on Sailor Moon, or anything else he talks about on this show, or really anything he talks about in general, but I'm at least expecting the bare minimum here. Duck should be expected to put more thought, effort, and research into this kind of stuff before putting it out. Because like it or not, that's what a reviewer is supposed to do. It doesn't matter how you advertise the tone of your review show, as a comedy, satire, or otherwise. You're still expected to give a proper outlook on the subject in question. The purpose of any review is to give an informative analysis on a given work, be it a movie, TV show, episode of a TV show, video game, comic book, or whatever you want to call it. People go to a review because they want an idea of the thing that's being discussed in the video, and you're expected to give a reasonable impression of the thing being discussed. No matter what, you need to correctly inform the audience about the qualities of the property, and if you can't do that, you fail to put out a good review. And this is the primary problem with the Sailor Moon episode. Even without the cringe-inducing sketches, even without the scenes where he misogynistically thinks the transformation scenes are strip-teasing fan service, even without the scene where he tries to defend himself for not knowing how old Serena was, we are halfway into this review, and Doug has said absolutely nothing informative, insightful, or educational about Sailor Moon. All he's done is repeatedly get details wrong, put together disgusting jokes with extremely ugly double standards behind them, and wave his junk in front of a camera. I said it before, and I'll say it again. If you want your show to be a comedic sketch series, don't advertise it as a review series. Because all you're doing is showing the audience that you care less about informing them about the qualities of a given work, and more about desperately trying to make them laugh at whatever random garbage comes spewing out of your mouth. Because of the priorities being put in making stupid jokes and sketches, Doug doesn't seem to care at all about informing his audience about what people liked about Sailor Moon, which is most likely the reason he gets so many details wrong. And with something with a following as widely spread as Sailor Moon, you can't afford to make this many mistakes. Once or twice is understandable, but when you're doing it for the entire video, it's a pretty good way to turn people away from your content. All you're doing is showing them how little you actually know about the subject, and giving them so many reasons to not take you seriously. This isn't even nitpicking anymore. These are very legitimate problems that are made severely obvious throughout the episode. This entire video feels like the equivalent of a kid being told to do a history report on Theodore Roosevelt. But they didn't bother to do any research on him and just told a story about how he was a pirate, and was black. In fact, why did people even bother to watch Doug's piss-poor review of the series again after it was re-uploaded three years ago? Kaluna Reviews did her retrospective on the series around the same time, and she clearly has more knowledge on Sailor Moon than either me or Doug could ever even hope to. Did they really think those disgusting jokes about Doug being turned on by 14-year-old strip teases and not knowing how old Serena was, and waving his dick in people's faces while portraying men as sex hounds were so ingenious and inspired that they needed to see them again? 40 DAMN! Uh, years old. <laughs> I swear, officer! I mean audience! I had no idea their real age! <laughs> Wow, there's more to this show than I thought. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he does some more talking about the main plot and eventually comments on Serena running away from danger. But once Luna reminds Serena to use her brain, she goes through her pedalicious transformation and is ready to kick ass. cowers in the corner like a fucking scaredy cat. Need I remind you that this is the first season of the show. Of course she's going to be scared, the whole fighting evil monsters and alien things is still new to her. And didn't you just finish ranting about how she was 14? Did you really expect her to be 100% fearless against this kind of stuff? Also, portraying Serena as just a coward undermines her character development over time, and several of her defining moments, like when she fought Rubius to protect her daughter, or when she fought against the Sailor Animes to rescue Darien despite going through an emotional crisis. Well, it'll probably surprise no one that Sailor Moon actually does very little physical fighting in this show. 
Which is no big shock if she even raises her knee a centimeter to kick, she exposes her goodies to the world. Which in many parts of Japan, of course, is no big problem anyway. I already talked about why this is a gross double standard, so I'm just gonna go back to what I said earlier. Most of the fight scenes require her being trapped or stuck in something for probably longer than is needed. Again, this is the first season. This is still new to her, and she's still gaining experience. This is Tuxedo Mask. And yes, it is painfully obvious who it really is. But please don't tell Serena, she's not very bright. Okay, what the fuck? If it was really that easy for you to figure out who Tuxedo Mask is, why couldn't you do the same thing for Sailor V? She was in the opening sequence, and she was in the picture you used in the intro. This guy's ability to decipher disguises must be on par with Ash Ketchum. The magic tiara isn't her only enchanted device, though. She also has a pen that can change her into anything. Wait, what? It's a very powerful transforming tool. It turns you into whatever you want. Well, then what the fuck is she using that tiara for? I mean, they didn't give any limitations or anything. They said she can change into fucking anything she wants. Hey, why doesn't she just turn around and be like, take on the form of Godzilla? <laughs> Series over! Six seasons spared! This was actually the fault of bad translation, because in the original Japanese version it's called a disguise pen. It doesn't just transform her into literally anything. It was only ever used for disguises to keep herself hidden to better complete missions. I can kind of understand making this mistake just going by the Deke dub, but here's the thing. For the grand majority of the review, Doug only ever seems to go exclusively by the Deke dub, without any consideration for the Japanese version. You still have to take into account that this is an American dub of a Japanese cartoon and mistranslations are actually pretty common. Not too long ago it was revealed that Xehanort's actual plan wasn't to create a world of pure light, but to restart the universe because he thought the current one was too broken to fix. This is an example of how because Doug goes primarily by the Deke dub without enough context from the Japanese version, he doesn't get all the details. And even if she took the form of Godzilla, I'm pretty sure that the main villain would have some kind of dark magic to blow her up. Making her bigger would make her an easier target. But nope, she uses it just to don disguises. Which really aren't necessary, seeing how all you have to do is throw on a bathing suit and a napkin over your crotch, and apparently nobody will recognize you. Again, that's a lot coming from someone who couldn't bother to recognize Sailor V. The other reincarnations of the Scouts are found over time, usually in the exact same city and often even the exact same school. But Serena doesn't find them at the same school. While it's true that the rest of the Sailor Scouts are in the same city, Amy was the only one who was attending the same school as her. The other Scouts are more scattered around, and in very different locations. Hell, Sailor Jupiter didn't even move into the city until episode 25. Seriously, these are mistakes that Doug could have avoided making by just looking at the screen. But it doesn't even feel like he watched the episodes and just assumed that the rest of the team was found at the same school because they have similar looking uniforms. So... Maybe Jedi should try his evil plans in another part of town. I mean, it's not like the Power Rangers that can beam anywhere. All this show does is glorify how lazy Serena is. Serena, a monster is attacking Tokyo! How far away is that? About 10 miles. Hey, it's just Tokyo. But you should... Okay, first of all, you show no instances of Serena being lazy. All you did was show one clip of her going to bed. And from the looks of this scene, it's night time. So of course she's gonna go to bed in her pajamas. Second, this joke doesn't even make any sense. Serena doesn't need to travel 10 miles to get to Tokyo, she lives there. Did you really care so little that you didn't even bother to learn about the character's location? Lily Orchard does more research than you. And yes, even the other planets over time joined the group as well. Ooh, except Pluto, um, you're not a planet anymore, so, um, yeah. Alright, aside from Pluto's not a planet anymore being low-hanging fruit for a joke, there's a bit of a loophole in what he's saying here. So apparently Sailor Pluto can't be a scout because it's no longer a planet. But that would have to mean that Serena, the main character, can't be a Sailor Scout. Because the moon isn't a planet either. Actually, things got kind of interesting with her character, seeing how Uranus and Neptune were cousins in the show, but not in the Japanese version. No, no, in the Japanese version, they were a couple. So only now, when the review is almost over, does he ever bother to use context from the Japanese version. Well, wait a minute. If he did take time to check the Japanese version, how did he miss they said the pen was for disguises and not shape-shifting powers? Were you seriously just being selective on what kind of research you were doing based on whichever jokes you could come up with for this video? This is what I mean by Doug caring more about comedy than actually reviewing something. He just goes by what he thinks is giving him material for jokes instead of actually informing people about the show. Could you imagine a world where every 
scientist is replaced with a clown, we'd be sent back to the Stone Age in seconds. Yeah, kind of funny how we can sex up our 14-year-olds all we want. Will you stop saying that? How many times do I have to tell you? They were not sexualizing Sailor Moon. It was made to be a family-friendly show and in several cases was targeted at little girls. What the hell are you trying to tell us, dog? That Kayoko Takayuchi wanted to make a series to teach little girls how to dress up in miniskirts and look slutty? That she was making the transformation scenes for perverted teenage boys? That girls can't like Star Wars? No! I'm not gonna let that go! So just to check. Okay, shame. Okay, shame. Oh, so now you're addressing the double standards of America marketing sex after you spent five minutes blaming Japan for it. Yeah, this really would have been nice to have a good 12 minutes ago. Come on, guys, maybe you could have worked it into your half ass PSAs at the end. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention, there's PSAs in this show. Obviously slapped on at the end of each episode using the same animation they used before. Because Lord knows, the show hasn't repeated enough animation already. Yeah, the PSA was obviously really gimmicky, but you have to point out that it wasn't the show's fault. I guess for whatever reason, the 90s felt like there had to be a PSA at the end of every cartoon. So the Deke dub decided to go that route just to fit into a fad. Though I'm pretty sure that's just on Deke because I don't recall the Japanese version ending with a PSA. Or in the case of the lesbian duo, maybe they can do something like... Hey kids! You got boys and you got girls! Pick one! Okay, this is getting ridiculous. And I've seen plenty of bullshit up to this point already. You can't just pick what gender you're sexually attracted to. It's something that the individual has to develop naturally over time. That's like telling kids to pick which foods they like without realizing that taste buds develop over time. It's not as offensive as a lot of other stuff that's happened in this episode, but it's still a highlight that he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. And guys, that's as far as I got. Oh, you think? I can't possibly imagine why. I know there's more characters and more villains, but I specifically wanted to address the repeated formula that got Sailor Moon popular in the U.S. You do realize the show's formula changed over time, don't you? In fact, that would actually explain why this review is such shit. He only ever talks about the first couple of episodes and judges the entire series based on that. Why are you making a case for the entire series when you barely saw the first season? That's like if I played God of War for an hour, then gave a review of the game based on my extremely limited knowledge of it. I can do it, but that doesn't make it a good idea. One of the scouts discovers the plan, or fall for it herself. Transformation takes place via reused, sexually confusing animation. What the fuck is wrong with you, dude? While the Serena character is an annoying airhead, I will give her credit that she does at the very least have a character. It's not one that I like, but at the same time, it would have been easy just to make her a pretty face with no personality. But she clearly does have a personality, and goes to big extremes. And they do make her look strange and bizarre just as much as they do make her look pretty half the time. And though, yeah, she can be self-centered, she's never really mean, per se. And I guess from what I understand, the character does get smarter as the series goes on. Or at the very least, braver. Okay, so you just stated very clearly that all the time you spend talking about how stupid and cowardly she is, and all those jokes you made about how she's stupid and slutty was a complete waste of time. Look, either Serena does have a personality or doesn't have a personality. Pick one. You can't just say at the very end that she does have a personality when throughout this entire video you did nothing to show what kind of personality she has. As for sexing up a 14-year-old... <sighs> I think it's weird, but I guess there's always just gonna be cultural differences. And in all honesty, we've let out much worse. Then what was the point of that ramble you went on about Japan's consent laws? But the moments where she fights back and saves the day is always shown in a good light. So have fun with your little show, just keep it as far away as you can from me. And that explains your lack of research. Jesus Christ. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, I remember- Hello? Mr. Critic, uh, Dr. Hawk thinks he may have, like, finished that formula or whatever. Um, what the fuck is this? Lead on. Uh, guys, the episode is over. You can literally stop. Alright, Critic, I know I messed up with the Sailor Moon formula, but I've come up with a formula that's even better. Even better? You mean, like, more successful than Sailor Moon? Really? We're still doing this shit? 
three times more successful. Really? Yes, according to my calculations, this should be the most famous, most profitable formula the world has ever known! Okay, seriously, why is this still going on? Why are they continuing this mad scientist sketch? It feels like a throwaway joke that was just made for the opening, but now they want to stretch it out at the end just to artificially lengthen the episode's runtime. There is literally no reason for this episode to keep going. The review is over. You failed to give an informative analysis on Sailor Moon. Why are you still here? This should be the most famous, most profitable formula the world has ever known! Good God, Dr. Hat! What is it? What is it? Okay, okay. Three online performers, two male, one female, remake movies with the help of a German cameraman and Irish immigrant. I hate you. I, I really, really do. This really is one of the absolute worst episodes of the Nostalgia Critic. And to say that about an episode that came out before he started doing those clipless sketches with Jurassic World, it really sets the bar to a new low. I would have said that there are no words to describe how bad it is and that it has to be witnessed, but when you put it in words, it ended up being so much worse than I remember. I don't know how he did it, but somehow Doug managed to have shit coming out of his mouth and was talking out of his ass at the same time. Even if you're not familiar with Sailor Moon, it's clear to anyone with eyes and ears that that he didn't bother to do any research on the series in preparation for this episode. So much of this review is focused on how supposedly sexualized it is, and he barely goes into anything else. Even for the first couple of episodes, he was given a decent amount of material to work with. And this was seriously the best that he could come up with. And before anyone tries to say, Oh, but he's not experienced in anime. You can't blame him for making a mistake when reviewing anime because he's unfamiliar with the genre. First off, that's not an acceptable excuse. Second, well, why didn't he just make this a collab with one of the other producers? Someone who's actually knowledgeable on Sailor Moon. Bennett the Sage, Jesu Otaku, Swede. Any of the other producers who are more familiar with anime. Hell, even Lindsay Ellis would have watched more than a handful of episodes. He didn't even need to make it a full-fledged crossover. Just have a cameo appearance here and there to explain something when he gets confused. For God's sake, he could have just googled Sailor Moon or look at the wiki and read a basic facts on the show. Like how it was made by a woman, and not a man who wanted to exploit sex for profit. I wasn't expecting him to watch 200 episodes. I was just expecting him to be a little less clueless. He put virtually no effort into exploring why people liked it, which had very little to do with fighting the monsters. Was it because the characters were interesting, or the interactions between them were believable, or how the story was fun and well-written and was turning up something better than a lot of shit that was coming out in America at the time? Whatever it was, it certainly wasn't because of anything sexy because the show was being made with children in mind. No matter how you look at it, there is literally no excuse for why Doug didn't do any research on the series. Why do I say that? Because he clearly took the time to research Japan's consent laws. Apparently being ignorant about Sailor Moon didn't stop him from doing that just to get out of being held accountable for not knowing how old Serena was. And he even managed to fuck that up. The way he tries to elaborate and educate people on Japan's sex laws to show people how fan service affects people's understanding of sex is just so uncalled for. Especially since he doesn't even bother to talk about how the same things are present in America. He barely brings it up at all as a brief counter-argument for America's sensitivity towards homosexuality at the time. I get that Japan has some problems when it comes to dealing with sex, but Sailor Moon is not one of them. At least 95% of what Doug says in this review comes from a place of ignorance or just flat out not caring. He just bases his views on the most watered down and broken references he could think of. It just further shows how he cared more about trying to be funny than give an informed retrospective on the series. Speaking of which, the comedy is just so painfully awful. Even without the cringy sketches and gross innuendos, so many of the jokes in this episode are based on information that's factually incorrect. Some of them weren't even thought out properly, like the joke he made about how obvious it was who Tuxedo mask is, despite that he couldn't even recognize Sailor V, and she put less effort into hiding her identity than Tuxedo Mask did. The sense of humor that he goes for is childish, crude, and highly tasteless. And so much of it does revolve around the assumption that the characters and transformations were sexualized. I mean, does he even know that there's a character far younger than Serena who also partakes in these transformation sequences? I simply do not get for the life of me how Duck took any of this for being slutty or sexy or kinky or sexual strip teasing. 
Sailor Moon was not made to look like a slut at all, and it clearly shows. The designs of the Sailor Scout uniforms are based on basic school uniforms, and the transformations were fairly standard for what you'd expect from an anime of this genre. They were really cool and very well directed, and they were being done to show the Sailor Scouts scaring up for battle. They were never sexualized at any point. And I'm sorry, what the fuck was up with that comment about girls not liking Star Wars, or Duck being turned on by 14-year-old strip teases, or that sickening I swear officer I didn't know how old she was joke he made in the middle. Why did he think that any of this was okay? And why did anyone think that this was actually funny for even a second? There is nothing funny about this episode. The jokes have so many ugly implications behind them, and it just feels like Doug is making the same joke throughout the whole video. Sailor Moon is stupid and slutty. That is literally the way he describes the character throughout the entire video. Just fuck this episode. Fuck everything about it. It is just so much worse than how I remember it, and is without a doubt in the top three absolute worst episodes of The Nostalgia Critic. From the constantly getting details wrong, to the cringe-inducing sketches, to his miserably failed attempt to educate people on sex, to his clearly sexist views on the series, to his insulting portrayal of males having uncontrollable sex surges, to his creepy-ass jokes about finding the Sailor Scouts and their transformation sexually arousing, and how he tried to excuse himself for not knowing how old Serena was, then calling it jailbait the show at a convention? I wish there was a way I could burn this this fucking episode from my memory! How is anyone still taking anything this absolute fucking moron ever said or is still saying seriously after that? This episode just violates so many defined rules for acceptable content. It's bad enough that he decided to talk about Sailor Moon despite knowing nothing about it, but to do so in such a gross and insulting manner is just unacceptable. I'm done. I am just so done with this episode. I need to go. I need to watch something else right now because I just feel so unclean from what I just witnessed. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. God, just fuck this show!